Hello, my name is Tony Zanders. I'm the founder and CEO of SkillType, and I'm joined today by Johnny Bersico, our Chief Technology Officer. We are excited to share an update on identifying global expertise in the modern library economy with the CNI community. So allow us to start with the problem that we set out to solve a couple of years ago. Um, there is a global talent problem in libraries. Um, a few markers to kind of define the problem for us. Um, number one, libraries as organizations, but also information professionals, both struggle identifying in-demand skills. Um, on the one hand, you have the organizations that are um, trying to keep up with changes in what universities need, um, changes in what patrons are expecting. Some describe this as the uh, fourth industrial revolution that is bringing new technology and new ways of work, which imply new skills that are needed. And so organizations are struggling on that front um, to understand what are the skills that are in demand and professionals are um, as well. Even once identifying what these new skills are with the help of professional associations and um, conferences, acquiring those skills um, is its own separate challenge. Uh, and for the organizations, that means um, using recruitment to bring new people on board, but also um, reskilling individual employees is a challenge. Um, personally, uh, for individuals, it's a struggle to acquire those. Um, if you don't have a uh, budget or funding to, to fly to certain conferences or to pay for uh, coaching in certain areas, most employees working in the library profession um, don't have clear pathways to acquire those skills individually. And to make matters worse, this knowledge gap uh, organizationally and individually is not slowing down. Um, each year, there are um, new skills to be learned, new technologies to be adopted, um, new ways of work to be embraced um, that is just keeping this sort of ever evolving um, uh, as we look to the next decade. Some of the underlying causes of this that we've identified over the past couple of years, um, one is information asymmetry inside of every organization. So what we mean by this is on the one hand, organizations and the leadership or the administration has a good picture of the skills that are needed based on the strategic plan and what the university or the provost, um, uh, the direction they're taking the university in. But employees don't oftentimes have that same level of understanding. Um, and so employees are sort of grasping for straws in terms of what types of training should I be doing to benefit my organization? And so there's some asymmetry on that front. Whereas on the other hand, employees have a clear understanding of what they know um, and what interests they have personally as employees. Um, but organizations oftentimes don't, realize what expertise is lying within their organization um, or what their employees are interested in learning. So there's asymmetry on that side of the equation as well. Across the industry and the profession writ large, um, there's very poor visibility into the supply and demand of library expertise. And so each organization produces a job posting saying, hey, we're looking for this type of person to come and join. We're looking for this set of competencies. But to do that at that organizational level um, is taking a big shot in the dark because it's difficult to know and keep up to date with um, what, are, what is sort of the supply of um, that set of expertise. We don't know how many people are going to apply, how many qualified candidates we'll receive for this, this job posting. And we really just cross our fingers and, and do what we call post and pray, uh, because it's really impossible today to understand what the supply of that expertise is. And lastly, there is a grossly fragmented data landscape um, and also a grossly fragmented content landscape. And so 
Many different professional associations have their own annual reporting that is conducted, but these are all silos. Um, and that's within the US alone. If we think about this on a global scale, that just multiplies exponentially. And on the content side, a lot of the training that takes place by folks that um, in organizations like the logos you see here, including CNI, all of those efforts are also being done in silos. And there are hundreds of these training providers that manage hundreds of their own websites and repositories of training, and they aren't connected in any um, systematic way today. Faced with these challenges, we started asking ourselves some questions. Could we layer a technological solution on top of the organizational structures or groupings that already exist within the library ecosystem? Take the consortium as a hub linking multiple organizations together. As such, knowledge of its member organizations' available skills, or lack thereof, allows this consortium to serve as a skills broker of sorts, enabling resource sharing across its membership in ways that have traditionally been near impossible. Traditionally, if an organization needed someone with a particular skill to temporarily contribute to an initiative, they might take the route of a costly and time consuming search or try hard to find someone internally willing to learn this new skill. With this model, however, an organization can instead leverage their consortial memberships to surface someone within their own network who previously would have been unknown to them. This approach also empowers consortia to leverage their unique position to provide a new level of service to their members and foster increased collaboration and resource sharing. Let's dive into a quick demo of this capability. I'm going to log into skill type. And uh, immediately what you're going to see is uh, a learner profile. Um, as, a, as a user of the platform, I have a couple of different roles. I have uh, the role of a learner, um, which is uh, by default, when I log into my dashboard, you're seeing that I'm getting some recommendations for uh, learning. I can engage on this week and what I was uh, recommended uh, last week. Uh, but we're not going to spend too much time on the learner aspect of things uh, for the time being. Um, the second role that I have is that of an organization owner and that of a consortium owner. So to demo the uh, consortial experience, I'm going to select the uh, artificial consortium here. Uh, the default page, or rather the profile page for a uh, consortium, um, would be no different than that of a, a of a member organization, right? It has a strategic directions, it has key skills and key products, just like any other organization um, that are a member of this consortium. The uh, in the same way, there is a directory that uh, lists also all the members um, into my test account here. Uh, the what makes this interesting, however, is that in the, under the members section, I get to see all the members that make up this consortium. So, uh, for example, I have uh, uh, several organizations here. I'm going to pick the uh, Dallas Public Library, which is a, a, a consortium member. Uh, once I select this, I get to see this uh, organization's um, its own strategic directions, uh, key skills, and key products. The, and uh, those the members that are a part of that organization, their skills can then start to surface up through this uh, consortium relationship that artificial consortium has with Dallas Public Library, so that when I navigate to the insights for uh, for this consortium, uh, the I'm seeing sort of a roll up of all of the skills spread across all of the organizations that are linked to this consortium. So this is the beauty of uh, this uh, relationship that is established between the consortium and consortium members, because uh, that uh, we can start to surface uh, these skills. And then now the consortium is able to uh, sort of uh, be that broker of sorts that we talked about previously, whereby they know which organizations have uh, the uh, people with the particular skills in mind. So if I wanted to navigate to find uh, those who with uh, um, uh, Alma, uh, Exibris Alma as, as, uh, as, a, as a skill, I could uh, do a search here and pull up the uh, members of uh, my consortium or this consortium here uh, and which organization they come from, right? I can see that I have uh, one individual that exists within this, this organization, but also I have one uh, within a member organization, uh, in this case, uh, uh, Grinnell College. So the, the, again, all of that data is, is bubbling up to the consortial level, allowing uh, the consortium then to then be able to sort of establish a relationship between uh, its different member organizations um, for, for that resource sharing capability.
there's plenty more to go over that we don't have a ton of time for but uh, again please we invite you to uh, our regular monthly town halls where we can dive a bit deeper into uh, the the power uh, and the capability that the, this uh, this uh, uh, um linking together of all this data can provide so we've been able to make some incredible progress towards this what we would consider a, a global um uh, problem um looking at the library industry, considering that there's over two and a half million um, full-time professionals uh, at over a million libraries. Um, this is certainly a, a long-term view towards upgrading the, the talent infrastructure for our organizations, but also for our, our professionals. Um, but we're not starting from scratch. The past two years have been incredibly productive. Um, we've built a global community of libraries training providers and information professionals across three continents, uh, and that is growing each month. Um, we've also been able to um, make a large amount of headway on standardizing um, a set of APIs that allow us to start using the same terms when we're describing um, various objects in this platform. So for example, as Johnny illustrated, um, people using skill type are using the same terms when they describe their skills and interests as organizations are when the organization describe their needs. Um, and same for training providers describing their webinars. Um, we're now all using the control vocabulary that has been packaged up into um, uh, modern um, standardized APIs. And the content aggregation and description effort is well underway. Um, we now are proud to say that we have the largest training database for library professional development. There's over 8,000 of these resources that go through our uh, metadata enhancement. Um, we're adding about 100 of these uh, per week. Most of these are open access resources that are publicly available on the web, um, but we're helping people and organizations surface the needle in the haystack. And lastly, in the most difficult part that we've achieved thus far is standardizing an onboarding process for libraries across library type and across geographic regions. Um, this has been the most gratifying part as well. And I'll walk you through what this onboarding is like in the next slide. So first, libraries conduct what we call a needs assessment. And so this is an automated process where a library's leadership team can come together and create a single source of truth on what expertise is needed. Um, and this will vary from library type, whether it's an academic library or a public library. Um, we even have um, state libraries and medical health sciences libraries in the skill type community. So regardless of the type, this gives the library a way to say, hey, here are the skills that we need um, in an ideal world. Phase two, we call the talent audit, which is where we invite all of our employees. They take their own personal uh, skills assessments and we see what people are interested in learning and what they're capable of doing. And we're able to layer those data sets on top of one another to do an overlap analysis, which surfaces the skill gaps within that organization. Um, and then once we can see what skills we have, which ones we're missing, we're then able to do a content survey, which is to look at that, that 8,000 uh, resource database and say, here are the skills that you're able to reskill people for based on the available content and training versus here are the ones you'll have to go outside of your organization and recruit for. And if you belong to a consortium, we can surface the expertise that that consortium has if you're missing it. So this is a process that we are already seeing libraries can sort of put some effort in up front about a month's worth of time to set it up. And then afterwards, each of your employees are off to the races um, managing their own uh, training and development, taking ownership over their growth. So current challenges that we've identified um, that we're, we're, we're working on each week, I'd say the first is there is an organizational learning curve for this idea of data-driven talent management. Most of the work 
I'm personally involved in and, and uh, others on our team um, that aren't on the engineering team is really just explaining and onboarding organizations to this new way of thinking about talent. Um, we usually don't associate um, our, our personnel and talent with data. Um, it's usually a pretty qualitative um, uh, environment, but we're bringing data to this conversation and we're finding ourselves in really interesting conversations, uh, positioning the library at the, at the university level to say, hey, you know, we have data to contribute to the broader institutional um, um, priority of, of assessment. Um, and so now the library has a, a stronger voice to play by um, taking a more data-driven approach to, to talent management and human resources. Um, there's also a, 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 a significant personal learning curve around training automation. Um, we're building this platform during a time where there's a very high degree of skepticism to um, technology and software. Um, there is a very real surveillance state at play with big technology. And so we, out of the gate, have embraced policies like GDPR out of the EU and others to hold ourselves to a very high standard um, to make people comfortable with this idea of automating their, their, their career development, automating their, their training and development. Um, because once this is sort of done correctly, there is a vast amount of benefit for people, busy professionals who don't have time to keep up with the amount of, of resources that are out there. People don't have time to monitor the email listservs all day. And so there's a lot of missed opportunities for finding that, that right opportunity and skill development, um, whether it's a webinar or a conference. Um, and so there's massive benefit, but there is a personal learning curve around um, a modern uh, privacy policy that makes everyone um, uh, comfortable with the amount of data that's using, being used for personalization here. And lastly, as we've alluded to before, out of the gate skill type is already a global community, but that also implies that there are languages, policies, and other localized um, um, traits that skill type has to evolve and grow in order for this truly to be a, a global experience. Um, but we're surrounding ourselves with the right partners uh, um, and the right thinkers in this area. Uh, and we believe we're well on our way to addressing each of these challenges. And the one thing I'll add here is that the the there are patterns uh, from a technology standpoint. Um, so usually, you know, when when we come up with these uh, challenges, Tony understands the, the the business aspects of these challenges, and, and it is my job to come up with a te technological solution for them. And thankfully, for a lot of these, there are existing technological solutions to address these things, such as the privacy concerns, such as the globalization of the data. Uh, of data, there are there are uh, parts of the world that have uh, um, localization requirements. Data cannot travel across borders and things like that. So we have the te technological uh, capabilities and expertise uh, to provide uh, this, uh, this uh, le level of uh, flexibility for organizations that so require it. It is something that basically we have as part of the sort of foundational um, aspects of the platform so that this is not something we have to retrofit in uh, after the fact, um, which can be uh, quite costly. So this is something that we factor into, uh, into the platform on day one. And in terms of what's next, we, as I mentioned, have a pretty active community um, of uh, people ranging from um, library workers to administrators and from all different types of libraries. Uh, each month we hold town hall meetings that are publicly available. And it's one of the first places I've seen where you have public libraries intermingling with academic libraries, state medical health science, special libraries, all centered on the conversation of how can we use technology to, to better support the profession um, with our growth and development. And so we'll continue to experiment with um, these emerging technologies and approaches. Um, each of these are validated and vetted by our community before we put these into development. I think another thing to look forward to next has to do with the way that we um, collect feedback. Part of the reason we are excited to be at CNI is that this is a community that um, ideas can come in their early form. And 
a constructive dialogue can um, take place with some of the greatest minds in our community. And so um, we do look forward to the feedback we receive um, from this fall CNI meeting, um, because we're, we're certain that some of the challenges you're dealing with in your institutions um, can play a role in the priorities we set for uh, the roadmap. And lastly, uh, but certainly not least, um, achieving that, that critical mass. Um, we still don't know what that specific number of institutions is or that specific number of learners is, um, but we are very optimistic that the potential of skill type will be unlocked once we achieve that critical mass. Um, and so our, our call to action to you today, um, aside from um, just giving us that feedback, is to get involved. Um, and so any of you can create a free account for skill type right now just by visiting our website. And if your organization is in the process of rethinking the way um, people are managed as we wrestle with this new post-pandemic um, environment, um, contact us. Um, we're able to set up a trial for your organization to take this, take a look at this more data-driven approach. Um, and so thanks so much for your time and we look forward to getting your feedback.